Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody and welcome, uh, welcome to this session. My name is Patrick Valance, I'm the UK Government Chief Scientific Advisor and uh, great to welcome you to what I think is going to be a really fascinating uh, session. The um, BIT, which has been such an influential group across uh, UK Government uh, for many years, has a mark, one mark of success which is that other departments have picked up and this is now embedded in departments and one of the things we're going to hear in this session is from individual departments how they've taken this approach and how the behavioral insights teams in departments are leading change both at a micro and a macro level so i think it's an opportunity to see this really acting and uh, and having an impact at a departmental level so um in this session, uh, there will be an illustrator describing the presentations, and I encourage all of you to get involved in this as, as well. Uh, take photos, share via social media, and at the end, and this is really an important thing, that if the speakers are on time and keep to their time, there will be time for questions, and I think that will be a good thing. So I'd rather like that to happen, and Moira is going to be putting up cards telling you when five minutes and one minute are up, so uh, please pay attention to that. And if we get to the end of your time, I will stand up here and throw you off stage. So that's the system, and we're going to try and uh, make sure that works. So uh, the first presentation um, is Lab to Field, Optimising the Help to Save Programme with Behavioural Science. And this is uh, uh, about transforming a traditional paper-based intervention into an effective um, set of digital interventions. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome Nancy Brewster and uh, Joseph Sherlock to present this. Nancy uh, is in the Behavioural Insights and Trial Advisor at HMRC, and she works on a range of projects applying behavioural insights to tax policy context. And Joseph is Senior Behavioural Researcher at the Centre for Advanced Hindsight, where he leads the team that focuses on applying behavioural sciences uh, to government. So welcome, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Research by the Money Advice Service in 2018 found that 21% of UK adults um, have little or no savings. And um, according to the charity Step Change, only £1,000 in savings is enough to reduce the likelihood of the average UK family from falling into debt by 44%. The Help to Save scheme is a government-backed savings account that encourages low-income earners to build a savings habit. Uh, the scheme was launched in January of 2018 um, as, a, as a pilot, and in September of the same year, it was rolled out to all eligible individuals. Those are uh, working individuals on low incomes in receipt of tax credits or universal credits. The scheme allows individuals to pay up to £50 per calendar month into their account, and after two years of savings, they'll receive a 50% bonus worth a bonus worth 50% of the maximum amount saved over a two-year period. They're then eligible for a second bonus um, if they continue to save above that af after another two years. So obviously the scheme offers a really high incentive on savings, far above the kind of interest rates we see on, on kind of high street um, banks. Um, but the problem we found was that these high incentives weren't reflected in account holder behaviour. So within the trial period, we had just short of 50,000 new accounts opened, but only 59% of customers actually deposited into their accounts. So the challenge for us was to understand how we can prompt customers to, to make that first step in building a savings habit and actually deposit into their accounts. And we were given the opportunity to see how behavioural levers and email, monthly email messaging could encourage people to do that. So this project has been a collaboration between um, the Behaviour Insight and Research Team within HM Revenue and Customs and the Centre for Advanced Hindsight at Duke University. This collaboration has been particularly strong because it's allowed us at HMRC to be close to stakeholders where we can embed change and be close to customer data, while also giving us the opportunity at Duke to um, practice some of these ideas in the lab. So our, our approach has been to iteratively test ideas um, and take a kind of broad brush approach to begin with in the lab and test as many ideas as we could come up with and take the best performing ones through to the field to see how they um, work with our customers. So the project has developed over nine months since June 2018 and as you can see we, we tested a range of um, theoretical concepts. Um, 
for the first couple of months. Um, and what we'll mostly be talking about today is um, our testing on the population I've already described, so those customers who held an account but had never deposited into the, into the account. But in the final two months, we also tested a new population of eligible customers who had not yet set up an account. And for those customers, we ran SMS trials using behavioural levers in messaging to see if we could prompt them to open an account. Cool. So we're going to run through four different areas, sort of four uh, areas of, of insight from our, from our work. The first one is going to talk about uh, loss aversion, social norms, and then uh, fear of missing out. So in this context, loss aversion is particularly interesting because the account is time-bound. They have a, a limited amount of time that they can uh, benefit from this. And so each month that they don't pay in the maximum amount and as a result uh, redeem the maximum amount of savings is a month lost and it's permanently lost. So, so emphasizing that loss and that the, the sort of permanent nature of that is a, is a really interesting idea and one we wanted to play with in this context. Similarly, social. Uh, this is an area where in the period that we were testing, the program was going from, from beta uh, into a more uh, soft and then full launch. And so it was, it was a context where people were increasingly uh, coming on board. It was getting... Um, uh, publication in the press, uh, and so sort of there's this trending social norm. So again, it was a really interesting uh, uh, context to use this sort of dynamic trending social norm idea. And then we look to combine, combine the two into this concept, uh, fear of missing out. So what we're trying to say here is uh, other people are benefiting from this great opportunity and you're missing out. So the combination of the two. Okay, so first idea is what do we find? I think the first thing to pull out is that loss uh, seems to work relative to no message, right? So this is just a very simple, obvious insight. If we send people the, a loss message versus sending them nothing, we see just under about a three percentage point change. This is across multiple studies, um, and this is, this is quite strongly statistically significant. Great. The next thing to pull out is loss relative to receiving any other message. Loss is the, uh, is the best performing one across, again, across a, a range of studies, and we see that about a what is it, about a, a two percentage point change that is, again, statistically significant. Um, what's interesting, what I'm showing you here is, is a graph that's from one study in particular in October where we tested the, the loss social and fear of missing out idea. We see that um, relative to, to a social message, a loss message does better, but that adding a social message to a loss message actually detracts from the loss message. So we're not exactly sure why that is. We haven't picked it apart, and it might be something where we can pick this apart afterwards in a lab study. But it's a very interesting and curious finding that we want to uh, drill into more. The next thing we, we played with in loss is we had uh, anecdotal uh, evidence from uh, some, early, some early work in this area that personalizing the loss message uh, was potentially very effective. And what this is, is is highlighting to people exactly how much they're missing out on. Um, what we find is in the first time we ran this, we, we, we actually had a, an opposite result. We found that personalizing loss message being really, really salient about this is how much you're losing didn't work. It decreased the effectiveness of loss. We ran it again. We sort of didn't believe it. Um, and uh, in a slightly different context this time, it was in, a, in conjunction with a fresh start message in January, which we'll talk more about in, in, in a slightly later on. We found that it did work. So I think the message here is, is we're not sure. Uh, we're not clear exactly uh, if personalization is working or not. We probably need to dig in, uh, in into further into exactly what was different about these two contexts and different about the personalization. Um, curious, nonetheless. Thank you. Uh, the second behavioral um, concept we wanted to test was this idea of temporal granularity. So we know that decisions made in the present are often made um, to the detriment of our future selves. And that's because we lack a strong connection to our future selves and the consequences of the decisions we, we, we might make. A paper by Hirschfeld looked at um, encouraging savings into an auto-enrollment um, pension schemes and found that by framing um, contributions in daily rather than monthly amounts, encouraged uptake of these schemes. And that's because it makes the future and, and the consequences of our, our decisions more salient. So we took this theory to a lab test where we um, presented hypothetical situations that reflected the help to save scheme to participants, um, fra framing the bonus that was awarded in daily, monthly, yearly, and two yearly amounts. So that's, in this case, in the daily condition, the bonus was presented as 82 pence per day, whereas in the two yearly framing, 
um, the bonus was presented as £1,200 accrued over two years. Um, we saw, um, in terms of savings likelihood and mean pay and rate, which are obviously hypothetical measures, um, we saw this reflected from the, the behavioural literature, um, but we didn't see the same effect on importance of savings. Still, we thought this was a promising um, concept that we could test in the field, and we thought it might be particularly effective with help to save customers. So we, we did take it through to the field. And again, we saw no significant differences between conditions, but we did find that when we combined the more granular um, framing, so weekly and monthly, and compared that to yearly and two yearly, the less granular conditions, we did see um, directional improvement. Um, we were actually powered for the effects that we saw here, but in the event of the trial, we didn't get the sample size that we were hoping for. Cool. So the, the next one here we're going to talk about um, came out of an opportunity to try and increase savings uh, at New Year. So we had, a, at this point, which is January this year, we had a lot of people who'd, who'd signed up and hadn't been saving or hadn't been actively saving, and we wanted to make a push to try and get more people too. We know about the literature in fresh starts. But encouraging people to, to make a fresh start is often very effective. And we wanted to, to, to tease apart one idea here. We were curious to see if we framed, um, if we varied framing, the reason why someone hadn't been saving as either internal, so as a result of something that they were not doing, or external, so uh, attributed it to something, some uh, factors beyond their control. We had a theory that, that if we encourage people to see they're not saving as, as due to factors beyond their control, they might be more likely to start saving. So we took this idea. We took it into the lab, um, and we, we saw a, uh, what looked like a, a reasonably promising directional effect. As you can see on the right, um, the external attribution condition led to uh, uh, an increase both in uh, savings likelihood and uh, an increase in the mean amount they would report paying in. Again, similar lab study to the, one to the, to the methodology we had before. Promising, so we rolled it into the, into the field. Um, the first thing to, to pull out is we, we again suffered from this issue of we're, we're powering our studies here to about a, a percentage point change and looking to get about 4,000 people per cell uh, to see that difference. Again, we didn't get the sample we had, were hoping for or, or promised. We did see um, a descriptive difference, of, so uh, internal attributions on the, on the right on this graph, externals on the left, and we see about a percentage point change. This is um, uh, descriptive at best at this point. We can't be sure that this, this is a, a real finding. We need to have a, a, a study with a larger sample size to really know, but I think given the lab study, given the theory, and given the field study, this is at least promising. Okay, so the last area we're going to talk about now uh, is uh, we, we made a, a swap towards the end of, of this work and moved from encouraging people who hadn't been saving to start saving to encouraging people who had not yet signed up to sign up. So this is a, a, a large number of people across the UK are eligible or potentially eligible who, who aren't making the most of this. Um, and we moved from sending people email messages to sending them SMS messages. So we started with... Um, uh, an original message which we were given from, from the Help to Save team and said we were planning to send this, can you, can you do any better? Uh, and we came up with uh, initially 10 different options that we would want to vary. Thank you. For example, two that we pulled out here, one is uh, intention behavior. So we wanted to ask people if you intend to say, do, do you intend to save more in 2019? And ask if that intention behavior or question behavior um, effect uh, had any impact. Another example is this idea of you've been identified as eligible. I know this came up in, uh, was a positive finding in one of the early bit trials, actually. Um, again, if we suggest that people have been identified as eligible, are they more likely to sign up? So we took all of these ideas. These are just two examples that I've given. And we put them into a lab study. Again, similar structure to the last one, similar, similar outcomes. And across our different outcomes, we consistently see that intention behavior and identified as eligible seem to do better. So across our three different outcomes. So it's re reasonably consistent, reasonably promising. And so what we were able to do is, is reduce from this long list of 10 different ideas, which had loads of things that we all thought were, go were, were going to be really effective, and narrow into um, a field study, which then just included intention behavior, uh, identify as eligible, and we also added another factor, which was around personalization. Again, personalization reappears. In this context, it's just adding someone's name. And the reason we tested this is because it's a reason, you know, a non-trivial um, lift for the operational team to do this, and we wanted to see if it was worth it from a cost-benefit perspective to add this personalization element. So we tested uh, these two concepts next to a control group, uh, and we also had a, a simplified, so the, the original message effectively is on the right. 
what we find is a, uh, a statistically significant main effect of identified as eligible being the, the best performing intervention. And we also see a statistically significant main effect uh, of adding the personalization element to be also more effective. We see very significant effects relative to a control and also um, relative to the uh, SMS control. So this is, and what's, what's interesting about this one is this is an example where we got the, the sample size we, we were expecting. So this is a n equals 60,000. Um, very, very promising results coming out of this. Okay, so what have we learned? Let's pull together some of the headlines. First thing is we see a statistically significant large effect, well, small but potentially promising effect uh, in sending someone a loss, loss message versus sending them nothing. If, uh, if scaled or giving you an order of the magnitude here, if we send this message to, we see this effect across 10,000 accounts, over a year this would be 1.5 million pounds in people's savings accounts that wouldn't otherwise have been there. Similarly with... Um, sending people a lost message versus sending them any other message. Similar, similar uh, point in that we see about, about potentially £800,000 in people's savings account over a year, over 100,000 accounts. And SMS led to about an overall, we can probably point to a 2% increase uh, in people signing up. Okay, so let's step back and just have a last, few last words on this. I think what we've shown you is... Um, a reasonably interesting methodology, right? We start with uh, ideas from understanding the context, ideas from, th from theory, and we say we have lots of things that we think could work here. We only have limited slots in our field study. Uh, it turns out we had you know, even lower sample than we first thought, and so we need to be very um, parsimonious with what we, what we put into these field studies. Using lab studies in this way enables us to do that, enables us to, to take all our crazy, wacky ideas, narrow them down. We do see a reasonably reasonably consistent trend between what seems to work in the lab and what works in the field. And so this is a promising area. I don't think we can say that lab studies on their own uh, really give us a lot of insight, but I think in conjunction in this way, um, they really, really do. Um, I think it's also worth pointing to, uh, in this case, we've basically been using them as using lab studies to pretest. I think we can go further, and in, and in some of our other work, we've been able to... Um, use lab studies to, to pick apart mechanism, to understand why something is working, or to, to more, uh, in a more nuanced way, contribute to the theory behind why, why we're doing uh, what we're doing in the field. So I think this is, we're sort of just touching the iceberg here and showing you how we can use lab studies to pretest. I think there's a lot more we can do in this space, uh, and we, we are continuing to do in this space. So I think that's, it. that's all from us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to take questions after all of the presentations, but thank you uh, for a great presentation and for keeping on time. Second one is on um, overcoming inertia in energy tariff choices um, uh, uh, and looking at um, multiple trials, iteratively testing different approaches for increasing tariff switching using a traditional application of behavioural insights to communications. And uh, to deliver this, it's Annabel Bonus, who's somewhere, I'm sure. Annabel, thank you. Um, Annabel is Senior Behavioural Insights Practitioner at Ofgem, and uh, she currently focuses on understanding behaviour and using this to develop intervention and ideas to improve customers' engagement in the energy market. Annabel. Right, thank you. Um, I'm just going to start with a show of hands. Just wondering, who here in the last few years has either switched energy tariff or someone in their household has switched energy tariff or has thought about switching energy tariff? So just stick your hand up. If that... Right, so that's most of you. Great. So you guys are what we would consider as pretty engaged energy customers. You know it's possible to switch. You know, it's, you know it will save you money. You think about it and you make an informed choice. However, lots of customers don't do this. So despite the average customer being able to save about £300 uh, by switching from a default to a fixed term tariff, despite uh, there being lots of help and advice out there about switching, and despite often providing lots of assurances about the switching process, around 50% of customers still remain on more expensive default energy tariffs. And how it works in energy is if you are on a default tariff, you remain on that tariff. And over the years, people can rack up, um, could have saved a lot more money by switching. So it's, if you stay on a tariff for a long, long time, the impact gets uh, more significant on the customer. Uh, so 
Uh, Office Something that Ofgem has been thinking about for a long time, and three years ago we started a research program called the Customer Engagement uh, Program, where we looked at uh, the reasons, started by thinking about the reasons why people don't engage with their energy tariff choices, and how we could use behavioural insights to uh, encourage um, encourage engagement. And what we did was we came up with a number of interventions to encourage engagement, and we call those prompts. So the first thing we did when we started off this program is to think about why customers don't engage in their energy choices. And I'm going to apologise for the uh, colours on this slide. They were picked by my four-year-old. And I, didn't, yeah, and I didn't have the heart to change them. Right. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, when we ask customers who are disengaged from their tariff choices, so people who haven't switched for many years, when we ask them in surveys, the sort of things they say are that they're unclear about the level of the money they could save, they think it's going to be a hassle to switch, and they don't want to switch to an unfamiliar supplier. So one of the smaller suppliers tend to save you more money, but they're less comfortable switching to ones they haven't heard of. So some of the things we did in our interventions to overcome, in our prompts to overcome this were we highlighted the amount that they personally could save. So rather than saying the average customer could save £300, we would say, you know, Patrick could save £260. We make it really personal. Uh, we summarise the information that the customer needs in one place, so their consumption over a year, their current tariff, to make it as easy as possible for them to make the switch. Uh, and in some of our interventions, we actually signposted to alternative tariffs. We all have the current supplier, gave insurances about rival suppliers, so they would feel more comfortable in choosing an alternative supplier. However, what people say in surveys is not the full story here. So uh, these customers, lots of disengaged customers, it's not that they're trying to engage in their energy choices and, and not, not managing to switch is they're just not thinking about it at all. It's just simply not on their radar. So for those, for those things, we need to look to behavioural science to understand the real reasons that people are not switching. So, I mean, as, as you'll all know, uh, that one of the main issues uh, with, with defaults is that people do like to stick to the default choice and um, go with the flow. And as I say, with, it, with energy tariffs, this means staying on more expensive tariffs. Uh, we know that people are more likely to value something if it feels personal to them. And we know that people feel overwhelmed if there's too much choice. And if you've ever gone through the switching process, there are an awful lot of tariffs and suppliers out there to choose from. So what we did was we designed attention-grabbing communications, kept them as simple as possible with a very clear message. We removed as much friction from the process as possible. We sent the letters directly to customers uh, and made sure that they contained all the information they needed. And we signposted to a small number of tariffs uh, personally chosen for that particular customer. So once we did that, to understand the basis we would design these prompts on, we then went on to design the trialing program. So this has been a program that's lasted three years and it has been uh, 10, 10 trials in total. Uh, we second, we can, they fall into three main categories. So the first category are our better offer letter trials, where, which are different iterations of a letter which signposts customers to three cheaper tariffs, a letter or email, uh, sign, signposts to three cheaper tariffs, which are very, very heavily personalised. So they contain all the information the customer needs, uh, tariffs that are, uh, which are particularly suited to them, to their consumption, and we make it easy for them to switch by giving them the, the, the uh, details of the alternative suppliers so they can make a choice. Uh, I'm going to talk about this in a bit more detail in a minute, but the next category is our collective switch trials, which has been five trials in total, and that is based on that they, they take even more of the hassle out of switching. So there are three letters sent directly to customers, summarising the information, giving access to one exclusive tariff that's not available in the open market, and linking customers up with a switching service, a, a third-party intermediary who can help them switch. And we have two other trials that don't really fit into those categories. One was testing a digital service and one was prompting engagement at the end of tariff. If you're interested in finding out more details about these trials, then we're planning to publish all the details at the end of the month. And if you look on the Offshore website, all the details will be there. I haven't got time to go through all of them, but we're just going to focus on one particular trial. And that is our first collective switch trial. 
Now, I uh, just want to say that even though uh, I work in the Behavioural Insights Unit of GEM, this is very much a collaborative exercise, and we work very, very, very closely with uh, our, the policy team, future consumers, who uh, did an awful lot of the, uh, the design and the legwork uh, in designing these trials. Now, the collective switch trials, as I say, take as much hassle as possible out of the switching process. So, um, what they do... It, it, so what we do is we make it as easy as possible for the customer to actually make that switch if that's what they want to do. We use repeated messaging, so the customers get three letters over, over, um, over a seven-week period with a clear deadline uh, encouraging them to switch. Uh, we, we worked with a third-party intermediary who would be like a trusted intermediary who would be able to help that customer switch. And uh, we offered an online switching, so I'm posted to an online switching service and a free phone phone support where people get actual personal advice from, from um, on the phone about their particular tariff needs. Now, just to talk about the intervention itself. So from the customer's point of view, all this looks like is three letters, I say, over seven weeks. There's actually quite a lot going on in the background, so, um, but the customer never sees that. So there's data that are shared between their current energy supplier and a third-party intermediary. There, there is, um, there, there is uh, uh, different um, levels of personalization. There, there's lots of stuff that goes on in the background. But from the customer's point of view, it's really simple. And all they see is three letters that are very heavily based on behavioral science and build on all the previous letter trials that we're already aware of. Um, and they are designed to be as simple and salient as possible. So what was the impact of this trial? So in this particular trial, in the first clip to switch, we tested, we did a message uh, testing. So we test, tested the messenger. Was one arm had an, a clip to switch brand if it came from Ofgem. One branded as it came from their, well, it did come from their current supplier, and a control arm who didn't receive anything, well, apart from their normal bills and such. And as you can see from the chart, there was a really clear impact uh, and from the collective switch intervention, and particularly in the supplier branded collective switch arm. Also, uh, the average people saved uh, across across the trial was almost 300 pounds, and in total people saved uh, about 4 million. So a pretty substantial impact. But what was really nice about this trial, we did um, qualitative uh, interviews afterwards with participants, and we got lots of really nice feedback in terms of these are customers who hadn't switched for at least three years, and in many cases, much longer. And they just had not thought about their energy spending for a long time. And they were really appreciative of of this highlighting of their tariff choices. And this is a quote in the corner from one of the qualitative um, interviews. We got an awful lot of feedback like that. Okay, so moving on. So that's the end of our deep dive. We're now moving on talking about what we've learned from the program of all 10 trials. Um, and altogether, we've had over a million customers involved in these trials. Between them, they saved about 14 million pounds over a year. So pretty substantial um, impact. Um, and what we've learnt, really, is that in terms of what works in increasing engagement in energy choices, is that simple, well-designed, behaviourally informed communications really do work in terms of prompting engagement. However, like I say, it's only simple from the customer's perspective. There's an awful lot going on in the background to take those steps out of the switching process. We know that signposting to cheaper tariffs really, really does work. Um, people like um, having that reduced choice really helps people make an informed decision about their energy tariff choice. Uh, but the brand of that tariff does matter. So in one of our trials, um, we tested the impact of only um, having a small or medium suppliers uh, signposted on the letter, and that had a, still a substantial impact, but much less than when it was a well-known supplier. And we think that's partly because of, of the uh, audience of these trials, who just prefer a, a better-known brand. Uh, we know now that reassurance and hand-holding plays a big part uh, in the success of these interventions, um, particularly offering that phone service that I mentioned earlier. We got a lot of feedback from the qualitative interviews that this, this customer group really appreciate being able to pick up the phone and speak, talk through their options with someone and um, being able to have the reassurance of having the off-gem um, 
Ofgem mentioned on the letter as endorsing the uh, the switching and having the letters coming from their own supplier meant that it was a really trust they really trusted that the letters were genuine and they weren't being scammed. And also, uh, obviously, but I mean, removing friction from what is actually not that simple a process really works. And the more friction you remove, the higher switching rates you see. And what have we learned about customer behavior? Well, uh, I think one of the interesting things uh, that's come through from these uh, trials is that many, I mean, I put some, but actually many uh, disengaged customers will choose an easy option over the most economically uh, beneficial one. So often they will choose to go with, um, choose to switch to another tariff with their current supplier, even if it's not the cheapest, or they will go to one of the options that we signposted on the letter, even if it wasn't the most um, cheapest one on the market, and even if they had access easy access to that cheapest one. Uh, different customers respond to different prompts. So some customers, some disengaged customers, even if they haven't thought about this stuff for years, all you have to do is send them a simple letter going, you're on a more expensive tariff, and they'll do it straight away. Others need a lot more reassurance and hand-holding to get them to actually make the point of that switch. And we've developed a, a typology of this that we'll be publishing at the end of the month. And we've also learned that customers can be re-prompted. So on one of our trials, we went back to those who hadn't switched during the first trial, six months later, offering them a very similar intervention. And they, again, had really substantial switching rates, even though they'd already chosen not to switch the first time. And the interesting thing there was, lots of them didn't even remember the first lot of letters. They, but they were really appreciative of being prompted again. Also, uh, another interesting thing is that even customers we consider vulnerable, who historically have a very low energy tariff switching rate, can be prompted. They see almost the same level of impact of customers on the, um, what we call the priority services register, switching than customers who aren't on that register. And uh, another, finally, even customers who are engaged, who do switch regularly, who are already on a fixed-term tariff, can also benefit from a, a well-designed prompt. So one of our trials looked at the behavior of customers who are at, uh, on a fixed-term tariff. We reminded them right at the end of that tariff that they probably needed to think again about, about refixing, and we saw a much higher um, engagement rate than the control group. So that's me. Um, so finally, just to sum up, we have come away from this program of work, uh, which has been... You know, a substantial uh, team effort uh, with a completely new understanding of the level of impact that these behavioural, behaviourally informed interventions can have on this particular group. Um, and we think that we have learnt some really interesting stuff that we can hopefully apply to behaviour in the future as the energy market changes, but also others can take in terms of how we communicate with these customers. Thank you. That was terrific. Thanks very much. Um, I didn't put my hand up because I actually don't know whether I've changed tariffs, so I'm in, in a particular category there. Um, the next presentation is Improving People's Health, Applying Behavioural Science and Social Science to Improve Population Health and Well-Being. Traditional behavioural science techniques adapted and used in an innovative, innovative way to design interventions. And this is by Tim Chadbun, who's the Head of uh, Behavioural Science and Evaluation Lead at Public Health England. He's establishing and leading a team to undertake robustly evaluated interventions and advise on the application of behavioural economic psychology and evaluation to public health. So Tim, who I hope is here. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I should say we, we do also run trials. Um, traditional kind of behavioural economics trials sort of within public health. But I'm here um, talking about this sort of new approach in terms of strategic behavioural analysis because how many of you have thought, uh, as I have, how do we actually choose which behaviours to target and which techniques to use in the design of those interventions? A few hands, because there's a few hands, not, not everybody, but a few. So that's really what I'm going to focus on um, today. And the point of this is um, that with a, with a policy challenge that we have, um, how do we justifiably determine for an intervention what is that behavioural target, what are the barriers and facilitators to performing that behaviour, and who's the target population? When I say justifiably, I mean linked back to the evidence. And then how do we characterise related interventions so that innovations have a strategic fit? And obviously we're, we're doing that for the sort of holy trinity in public health in terms of impact, reducing inequalities 
and efficiency of public uh, resources. So that first bit I talked about is really what we call about called the behavioral diagnosis, including uh, the links to other uh, analysis and inter other interventions is what we call the behavioral analysis. Taking them all together, the, the diagnosis and the interventions is what we call the analysis. Um, and so what we're proposing is that to design interventions, we need a framework of behavior change that links understanding of the behavior to evidence-based policy levers and the techniques to change the behavior. So these are some of the commonly used behavioral science tools across uh, the UK government. You may be more familiar with those uh, on the top line. So quickly, if I can maybe quick ask for a show of hands, who's sort of aware of Combi? Oh, fantastic. And the behavior change wheel? Oh, look at this. This is going to be easy. It can save me a lot of time. Um, great. So, well, what I, I sort of had a quick look at some of the, um, these, uh, these frameworks. And I think, as you can see, from 2010 through to 2018 with the basic framework, um, there's always been a sort of recommendation for behavioral diagnosis, uh, talking about the explore phase, thinking about defining the outcome, understanding the context. And I think it's got more complex and more specific uh, over time. But I think um, also in parallel with that development, there's been work going on um, in other areas of psychology that we can draw from. So this is the theoretical domains framework. Um, you're saving me a lot of time because I can basically say that this is a, a sort of more detailed uh, model and framework, evidence theor theoretical framework um, behind the COMBI sort of heuristic. The, the COMBI is a heuristic sort of model of, of behavior. Um, so what you can see, these are linked, and the TDF domains, theoretical domain framework domains, uh, are in yellow, and you can see things like optimism, goals, emotion, social influences. And there's a more detailed framework even sort of within that. Those are the domains. The behavior change wheel, which many of you um, have seen before, links uh, the model of behavior in the center of that wheel to intervention functions around the outside, and policy categories that we pull. So we think about this in terms of once we understand the behavior and the drivers of behavior, we can think about which intervention functions are likely to work and then which policy categories or which levers should, should we be using. And then we can get into the specifics of intervention design. And the, the really uh, useful thing that we find about this is it was synthesized from 19 different frameworks in a kind of uh, international scientific process, um, including frameworks like, like Mindspace. And so it's quite uh, useful in that comprehensive way. So this is a simple kind of model diagram, diagram of uh, how we consider a strategic behavioral analysis. This is a very innovative uh, process. What we have on the left-hand side there is understanding the behavior and the barriers and facilitators to change, and then analyzing the interventions, the context of which that new, a new intervention might sit. That includes the national interventions, but also looking at effective research interventions that, are, that have been tested uh, and tried. And what hopefully that gives us, or what that should give us, is an identification of gaps and opportunities. And just in terms of sort of methods, the way we've been, or one of the ways we've been doing this is through um, sort of systems mapping and systematic literature reviews and coding, uh, stakeholder consultation, um, and again, literature review and coding. There's a mapping process which links the drivers of behavior through to the intervention functions and behavior change techniques. Uh, in the behavior change wheel and sort of concept workshops and again stakeholder service surveys that think about the affordability, the practicability, the effectiveness, side effects, etc., which might help you prioritize different intervention recommendations. So that's the kind of theory in a very small nutshell. We've been doing this in a number of policy areas within health and well-being. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of the impact that has had with uh, antimicrobial resistance. Um, but we've also been looking at diabetes and weight management, smoking, alcohol, and making every contact count, cervical bowel and breast screening, and cardiovascular disease. And as you can just see there, we've been looking at it from different perspectives, either just uh, public behaviours or the health professionals' behaviours, or looking at both uh, within the system where we've had the time and resources to do so. So I'll talk about antimicrobial resistance. You don't really need to know about antimicrobial resistance. I'm not really going to talk about that. I just want to try and show you a quick few pieces of sort of the impact in terms of uh, it can have. So this is a systems map. It's a very complex system. This is just one part of it showing primary and community care. 
but we can go from a sort of systems map to thinking about behavioral pathways. So this is, this is just a simple pathway from the patient perceiving symptoms, do nothing, self-care, or uh, help-seeking, potentially through to taking antibiotics. And what we can do with that is identify different parts of different actors within the system and different, this, be very specific about the behaviors that occur. So for example, patients using backup prescriptions or prescribers giving alternative non-antibiotic self-care advice. So we have a whole system and a whole specific explicit about the, the actors and the different behaviours. And then through the literature search and coding of the literature that already exists, we may, we may do primary research if we need to, but maybe the first step is to look at already what exists and um, the, the weight of evidence that we already have. We can start prioritising some of the barriers and enablers. So this is an example for a prescriber. Um, you can see how we can start ranking some of those domains of the theoretical knowledge framework. So we have beliefs about consequences, etc. Um, just in terms of examples, uh, what that might look, what a social influence might look like, advice from others, or perceptions of patient expectation. Environmental context might include evidence and guidelines, access to a patient's medical history. So we can really break it down into detail and get specific about what are those drivers and barriers of the behaviours. We also um, can get out of this a real understanding of what are those interventions that we're already delivering as a system. And it may not be that our organisation delivers all of those. We probably develop, uh, deliver only a few of those. But we need to know in, if we're going to add something to the system, what already exists and how valuable those are. Um, also, whether we can improve and, and adapt those. So this just sort of shows you quickly around the behaviour change wheel that we're already within the system. There's a lot of production of guidelines. There's a lot of communic communication marketing. There's a lot of service provision. Uh, and you can see some gaps where there isn't so much happening. Potential, potential gaps, that might be appropriate, it may not be. We can also look at the behavioural focus of the interventions. So this is just, a, 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 again, a quick, a quick look at uh, using the COMB. What you can see on the graph is the number of different, in, different intervention components that target those different aspects of COMB. Um, and the different lines are based on commissioners, providers, prescribers or patients, those different parts of the system. And again, you can see that we're addressing a lot of psychological capability and a lot of reflective motivation. And we're not using a lot of automatic motivation and social opportunity, for example. Um, when we start getting into the detail of the interventions, um, if you just look at the bottom of that, you can see these are the 26 national interventions that we identified and characterized. Um, again, you can see that we're doing a lot of instruction on how to perform the behavior. That is by far the most common sort of technique that we're using. Um, that one is, uh, is aligned to the, uh, the drivers of behaviour, but a number of the things that we're kind of using are not particularly <coughs> prioritised as drivers. But if you look at the top bit there in terms of the theoretical domains framework, you can see knowledge, which is definitely important, is key. Um, but those other things that we prioritised before and understood from the diagnosis are not being addressed necessarily very well, particularly emotions, hardly addressed at all. We can break that down still further to say, if we take something like skills, which we've identified as one of the top priorities, we can look at the interventions and identify we're, we're doing quite well in terms of using instruction. We're doing a little bit of modeling and a little bit of practice. But actually, there's a whole range of other techniques that we could be using, which we're not, such as graded tasks, habit formation, goal setting. That leads, this is just a sort of schematic, but that leads us to kind of um, intervention design. Uh, this is one example of what it might look like thinking about aspects of social influence and enablement, giving us potential behaviour change techniques such as social support, feedback on behaviour, problem solving, action planning, which kind of potentially could lead us into, uh, and we are exploring this as a, as a national sort of programme or to pilot as a national programme, something like a standardised quality improvement programme that includes uh, clinical pharmacists within GPs, tailored advice, um, looking at the underlying reasons uh, for inappropriate prescribing and, and Practice, practices coming together to agree practice plans. So it starts giving us a real kind of evidence-based way to design an intervention. So just the last uh, couple of slides. Um, thinking about the, the policy impact of this, um, it's really given us a strategic overview. Uh, we can see that there are many interventions already in this space. Uh, we target most of those domains that are identified in the literature as being important. Uh, and we're using some of the appropriate behaviour change techniques. Uh, so this uh, gives us a 
position to feed in uh, sort of upstream in the policy making progress po process. Uh, things like RPI is the, um, the, the, the national coordinating and oversight sort of committee in terms of antimicrobial resistance. So we're going to uh, presenting to them uh, and informing the strategy. And it's kind of been uh, an influencer in terms of the UK's five year national action plan. So we're getting upstream in terms of uh, policy. Uh, but it also can help start giving us plans for individual program improvement. So we can start looking at those different interventions that are already being delivered. We can start working with them. We've characterized what they do already and who they target. And we can start thinking strategically and systematically about um, how we can improve them and how those different things align. It's also leading us to uh, new interventions that we can design, test, and improve. Um, one of the things that's kind of been going along in parallel, you've probably heard about before, um, is the work that we did with BIT around um, letters from our chief medical officer to, to GP practice around a sort of social norm feedback. That's that, that one on the left, which is published in The Lancet. We've been doing work. Um, we ran another trial, which we're um, getting to the end of the analysis for um, in GP surgeries. So we ran a randomized control trial um, in a couple of hundred surgeries where we used, um, we, we had two arms. One was really around the sort of commitment device, a commitment poster based on work by Milkman and Doctor in the, in the States. Um, but also we tried something a little bit more innovative, which was um, an, answer, an automated message on the telephone. So when someone rings the surgery, so before they're at the surgery, before they're there in front of the doctor and the doctor has the pressure to, to prescribe, uh, a message which kind of says that the, uh, the practice, the default setting of the practice is not to, not to prescribe antibiotics. And there's also uh, some work here also looking at um, community pharmacy. Um, and this is an area where we have done some qualitative work which is published now, but we've also um, been running a randomized control trial which is still under, um, still under analysis. And then I think the wider learning for, for behavioral science is that um, this really gives us a be behavioral overview of the whole program or the policy area. It really specifies for us the behaviors and the populations at multiple levels of the system. It can give us a prioritized list of barriers and facilitators from the evidence synthesis and can list and characterize existing interventions and identify effective research interventions that are not yet nationally implemented and how they might fit strategically. Um, so, and again, I guess the, the key thing where I, started, where I started from was around the behavioral diagnosis and really providing a sort of prioritized evidence-based design for behavioral insights interventions, including that kind of appropriate intervention and policy levers. Um, and so, sort of finally, that also Organizationally, uh, where we get scrutiny uh, around our use of public resources, we have to th it can really help with the justification of our organizational strategy uh, through links back through to the theory and literature evidence. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, so we move on to the uh, last of the presentations uh, from micro, macro, establishing a role for behavioral science and applications of behavioral insights across government in a, at a strategic level. And Nathan King is going to deliver this, and, and he is the behavioral science advisor in the Department for Work and Pensions, and he works on investigating and challenging assumptions about human behavior with a particular focus on communications, both in the uh, Department of Work and Pensions and more broadly across government. Nathan. So I'm hoping to round off today's session. Uh, the previous presenters have given some fantastic views of what you can do when you take behavioral science off the chain, the techniques, the ways we can really move up scale. And I'm going to offer something slightly different, but I hope nonetheless very complimentary. How do we take that chain off? How can we look at the process so we create that space for behavioral science earlier on the process that lets us do those big, brilliant things? In a nutshell, how do we look at both interventions and processes? Now, I'm going to start with a rough sketching of a normal planning process in government. This is the OASIS framework This is used in government communications. It's used for every single campaign. It's extremely embedded. If you're a government communicator, it's basically the first word you say as a baby. And what it states, uh, is basically you start with objectives, you move on to audience insight, and then you create a strategy. How are you going to realize your objectives, the implementation? How are you going to do that? 
And finally, your scoring and evaluation, did you manage it? Uh, and at this point, the important thing to take away is not the particular acronym or how embedded this process is. It's just the general logic of you have to define a problem first, then work out what you're going to do, and then the day-to-day nitty-gritty of making that plan happen. Behavioral insights traditionally only comes in quite late, only comes in at the strategy and the implementation phases. And that causes problems. If the normally the problem is already well specified, and then what we're doing is either trying to generate an intervention that tries to deal with that, or given a pre-existing intervention, uh, and the best example of this is tax letters, the tax letters were already going out, we're just looking at what is the best possible way we can word them to maximize that positive response. This causes issues, and I'd say there are three main limitations. One is that an intervention can only be as good as the problem diagnosis. It doesn't matter if you get the best behavioral scientists in the world. If you task them with increasing the motivation for people to sign up to an online service, and then it turns out the real reason they weren't signing up is because they don't have access to the internet, you're not going to get effective behavior change. We know from the fundamental attribution error that, as humans, we are not the best inherent guides of why we do or don't do the things we do. So there's no reason to suspect that there's not at least some space for us to help challenge have we correctly identified the barriers to the behaviours trying to solve at the problem specification stage. Second one is that complex problems need multiple interventions, and I think Tim has rather beautifully illustrated that, but just to really hammer it home. If you consider something like climate change, possibly the biggest policy challenge we have uh, in this century, you can specify a thousand different behaviours for that. You've got to get consumers to buy electric cars or use more public transport to stop flying. You want investors to move their money from fossil fuels to renewable energy. You want house builders to build more efficient homes. You want manufacturers to be more energy efficient in the products they create. We're probably going to need to do most, if not all, of those things to get the kind of level of response that we need to tackle that problem. But if we're brought late in the stage to look at tiny facets of the problem, we can't take that systemic view. And also, if you believe in complexity theory or are a systems thinker as you really should be, you know that looking at one facet of the problem never lets you get the most effective solutions. You need to see how all the moving parts interact. And lastly, complex problems need multiple kinds of intervention. Now, I'm glad that most of you seem to know Combi already, so all I will say at this point is we know from this model any given type of intervention you can run does not deal with all potential barriers across all three categories. So, for example, communications can deal pretty well with capability, it can deal pretty well with motivation, and it can't deal with opportunity. It can tell you how to save well, it can convince you that that is in in line with your long-term financial goals, it's the kind of thing you want to be doing anyway. It can't increase your income, it can't reduce your cost of living, it can't make sure you have access to good savings accounts or banks that don't charge crippling overdraft fees. So unless we're thinking that there's a fairly small problem that only has one last barrier to get rid of, if we're dealing with complex problems that probably have multiple barriers across multiple categories, then we're going to need multiple types of interventions. And again, if you bring us it late in the process, you're probably not going to have to be able to do that. I think historically behavioral insights has has been dominated by communications interventions and user experience interventions, looking at giving people prompts and information or certain messages. And I suspect that's because if you only bring us it very late you price out a lot of other options. You can't do legislative change if the legislative framework is already determined and there's no parliamentary time left. You can't use financial incentives or the spending you need to make big, massive changes if the budget's already allocated. You can't be expected to do system changes if the system is already predetermined. So how might we create that space? How might we move earlier in this policy process? Well, we'd like to look at the example of some work we did with the government communication service. And just a brief bit of background, the Government Communication Service is the profession that spans all 4,000 plus government communicators in every single government department and arms like a body. Uh, and they are supported and led by a central team based in the Cabinet Office. And last year they set eight professional challenges for themselves, one of which was to master the techniques of behavioural science to make their communications more effective. So DWP, collaborating with their professional standards team and their insight and evaluation team, produced this document strategic comms, a behavioural approach. And this took Combi and integrated it into Oasis and sketched out a process by which you start with policy objectives. You specify those objectives in behavioural terms. You use Combi to run a barrier analysis. Why are those behaviours not already happening? And looking at all of those barriers in the round, ideally in full collaboration with your policy and any other major stakeholders, 
communications teams can identify the barriers that they can, uh, alone or in combination with other people, properly address. And those become your communications objectives. This is a worked example we have in the document that shows that process of uh, derivation. You start with your policy objective, increase the health and well-being of primary school children. You specify behaviour, get primary school children to exercise at least 20 minutes a day. And then if one of the barriers is lack of time available, then you convince your head teachers to schedule half an hour of PE in the school timetable every day. Uh, the only two caveats we put on this, and we do put this in the document, that you can normally specify multiple behaviours, and again, you may need multiple interventions, so it's not normally this nice, neat, linear process. It's more of like a complicated root and branch diagram. Uh, and the way we treated this was to kind of act as if we were slightly exploding out uh, the early stages of OASIS, specifically giving definition to that double arrow that previously existed between objectives and audience insight. So if we explode that out, again, you start with the policy objectives. You identify support behaviours. First bit of audience insight, you treat as your combi barrier analysis. You then set your communications objectives, then move on to further audience insight. This is the stuff that then starts informing your strategy, like uh, your audiences or your available channels. And then move on to the strategy and implementation and scoring as before. So I put this forward as a possible example of ways you might be able to create that space. And let's look at how well it scores against these three limitations. The first is that it's only good as the problem diagnosis. I think that's, that's a fair tick. It explicitly moves behavioural science into that very early process. Before objectives have even been finalised, what are the behaviours you're trying to generate? What are the barriers to those? And those inform your objectives, not just the strategy you create afterwards. Complex problems need multiple interventions. That's a little trick yet. It doesn't explicitly do it, but it's not uh, prohibiting either. We find it's a fairly simple process in general, but the, um, the detail is in the application, which is why we've been running surgeries with various departmental comms teams. We look at specific campaigns and how you apply this model in practice. Uh, and the thing we found that is that they can do that, and they do appreciate that, that you can break things down into multiple levels of behaviours, multiple different people. So if we stayed in the education space, for example, they would know that uh, even if you're ultimately concerned with the behaviour of the pupil, you need to look at the teachers, you need to look at the parents, you need to look at the, possibly the education suppliers. You need to look at all of them, and you may need to look at specific interventions for each of them to get you to that final intervention. Finally, complex problems need multiple kinds of interventions. Well, that would seem an explicit no, because this is very deliberately only looking at one function that does one type of intervention. But something we were very clear and explicit of in the document is that thing I've already said. Communications can't do opportunity barriers. And so we tell all of them, when you face opportunity barriers in your research, you have to refer that back to the policy team because you will not get effective behaviour change. And if nothing else, we hope that is the prompt to make sure that all tools are considered. What are the implications of this? Well, there's four as far as I'm concerned. The first one is just that, in theory, it's possible. We've done it at least once. You need to be cognizant of all the different circumstances that are required, but we can change processes and build behavioural science into them. The second uh, is that I find strategic is a, an off nebulous word. Dictionary definition is very simple, but in practice it's very difficult to mean. If I had complete say, I would have any senior leader who uses the word strategic and can't provide an immediate definition dock that day's salary. <laughs> and I will extend that to the words culture change, engagement. <laughs> There's about 10 other words, let's not go there. But the reason we use it here, and I have to take some culpability because I chose that document name. The reason we use strategic is because you have that clear, very clear link between the policy objectives all the way to the communications activity. You've got that chain. Uh, and we even say the fact you are focusing straight away on the behaviours. Well, the nature of behaviour is it's an observable action. It's something that happens in the real world. So you know you're always targeting real world consequences, not more ephemeral intermediate things like sentiment change or awareness or attitudes. The third one is that I think the reason this works so well, they've now adopted this as core practice. It is required knowledge for every single communicator, regardless of experience or discipline or grade, is that it was collaborative. They came to us asking to bring more behavioural science in. And they had existing challenges. For example, they wanted to communications to be uplifted as this uh, tool for implementing policies, for engaging in behaviour change, not just announcing things after the facts, not just limited to press releases and public information campaigns. So, okay, we can do that. We can take behavioural science and we can help you address those specific challenges that you already have. 
And that kind of leads me on to the final implication, which is that it's about behavioural science, not necessarily behavioural scientists. And I say that conscious that I'm in a room of behavioural scientists and I'm not trying to do all of us immediately out the job. But what we did was take a tool set that we had and not just lob it over to them. We integrated it into their existing planning framework. We said, what can we take of ours that will support the things you already do, will enhance your existing professional expertise and specialties? And how can we make that complement your existing tool set, your existing arsenal, not just sit awkwardly on top of it? The reason uh, we need to focus on behavioral sciences rather than scientists, well, the reason I'm so proud to work in this field, the reason I can happily get out of bed every morning and go to work is because, bold claim, but I think behaviors are the one constant in every single thing government does. And so I think we can legitimately, if again, somewhat boldly claim that behavioral insights has a useful role to play in near enough everything government does. But it wouldn't be practical or desirable to have every single civil servant be a psychology graduate. And if we think that the, the ideal for society is that we have, say, some brilliant mathematicians, but then everyone else be numerate, by that same token, we want some brilliant behavioral scientists, which luckily we already have. But we also need everyone else to at least have that ability to apply behavioral science to use some of those techniques. That is where we get the best of both worlds. And if at least looking at the kind of process in these frameworks, we do have a slight ability perhaps to do just that. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, all of the speakers. I think a really fascinating session. And uh, thank you also for keeping to time, because that means we've got time for questions. And uh, I think the questions are coming in through the app. Uh, so I will pick a few and give them to you. And then uh, if people want to come back on them, they can. Um, so one here is, which, which behavior change frameworks do each of the panelists use or find most useful? And I think we keep this brief, otherwise we're going to go into a um, problem not getting many, through many questions. So I think one, almost one sentence answers to this. Nope. I'll shout. Uh, well, for us at Combi, we um, quite badly for behavioural science users it rather religiously, but I think we want to be abreast of all the different techniques and look at those as well. The area of interest for the moment is social practice theory, so we're looking at that as well. Another book, Combi here, but yes, the one we use most often, uh, and I promote it all the time. Uh, Dan presented ours earlier, the fuel and friction, the rubbish. Right. I'm going to break the mould and say it's the right tool for the right job, rather than any specific tool. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, one uh, actually specifically for you, Annabelle. Um, it says, what is the optimal number of behavioural levers you can use in a communications? Is it possible to use too many? Well, I mean, I, to be honest, uh, I don't know. Oh, oh, so we use an awful lot of uh, levers in not just communication, but design of all the so, uh, design of the interventions generally, all the back wing stuff that you can't see. Um, and I have no idea if you can use too many, because that's another something we've tested. Um, I suppose on a, a theoretical level, uh, it's true that the more you use, uh, the more that you potentially allow for positive or negative spillover effects is the kind of you have to deal with the interactions of different levers, not just the individual ones. But I think this is the reason we, we test stuff so so rigorously. Could you use the microphone? Oh. Hello? Ah, it's, oh, it's on now. Oh, great. Um, so I guess we have to be careful that, but that's, how we, that's why we use so rigorously test everything, so that even if there's sort of complex interactions going on, it still works. I think the bigger question is how does the communications then look? So if you can use 10 different levers, say, but it still comes across as one simple, single, coherent message, then it's probably not problematic. Yeah, and I would say, you know, um, obviously apply the behavioural science, but also just um, show it to customers, or to users first. Uh, we did an awful lot of user testing, different, different iterations, lots of rounds of user testing before we even went to field with our communications, just to make sure that they do actually... Um, you know, make sense because uh, that is the most important thing. I just say as well. I think it, I mean, if you've, um, as Nathan was saying, if you've got a large complex intervention, you might be using different sort of techniques throughout that in different places. Um, if you've got a letter or text message, you're going to be much more limited. And I think obviously we're all probably trying to keep things simple and reduce cognitive load. Thank you. Uh, can I uh, um, ask a question, Annabel? Because this one came to you first, and I want to ask you a specific question, which I. I, I 
the um, brand thing that you showed, where actually it mattered a lot, mm. whether it was Ofgem or the supplier. Oh, yeah. What's that all about, and what does that tell you about Ofgem? <laughs> I'm, you know, Ofgem has a well-established brand, maybe, maybe not as recognisable as your own energy supplier. I suspect that plays a huge part in it. And um, I think people do open. So uh, it's not just about the letter, the branding on the letters themselves, but on the envelopes. And I think lots of customers would just routinely open communications from their energy supplier because it's about their energy supply and it's about their money. So I suspect that plays a big part in it. Um, but also I think there is something about particularly compelling about having your own energy supplier writing to you saying you're you're on a more expensive tariff and you might want to think about switching to one of our competitors. Lots of the qualitative feedback we got, that is a very surprising and strong message. And I suspect that's why it worked a lot more than the off-gem brand. Yeah, it just strikes me that that in that situation you're up against a problem if the the suppliers actually have such a massively higher effect than off-gem does because they may have other interests in the messages they give sometimes. Indeed. Okay, um, so uh, this is quite an interesting one, actually, and it relates to something that I was interested in, particularly in the, in the first presentation. Given the relatively small effects you get in some cases, not in all the cases, are you considering more extreme interventions? So let's take it there, and then maybe others may want to come in in their own areas. Is this on? Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, so, so linking to the, to the last talk as well... Um, It's not the case that we came in to help to save and thought, let's just throw out a load of email trials. It's actually the case that we started right at the beginning and ran some workshops and played with lots of different ideas, ranging from his wording that we would change in an email all the way through to restructuring the account or setting it up. So, for example, when someone makes an initial payment, that payment is set up as an automatic reoccurring uh, payment that just rolls each month. Um, So we we wanted to and and sort of played with in workshops lots of ideas like this. uh, in reality, when we get to, to what we can actually test, run a randomized control about, trial around, um, significance test, and then put up on a graph, it's unfortunately more often than not in a government context the, the communication stuff. That doesn't mean that some of the bigger ideas we had uh, weren't implemented uh, into, into some of the work, and we just never know. Uh, we don't fully know if they did it or not. I think in some cases they definitely did because we could see it in, in the app, for example. But we don't really know whether or not it worked because there's no opportunity to, to get it a counterfactual. So, yeah, in short, we were definitely playing with bigger ideas, but the bar graphs we can show you are from comms. <laughs> and, and do you want to comment? You sort of went over quite quickly the, 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 the non-replication where you had two studies which showed different results. How do you think about dealing with that? And, you know, when you're dealing with very small effect sizes, what approach will you take to sort of try to narrow down what, what is a really important effect size and, and one that is reproducible and, and can be replicated? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question and a good point. Um, and we had to sort of push through things in 15 minutes, but we ran about 14 field experiments and all told, I think, uh, I think six different lab studies in, that, uh, in the last sort of nine months on this. Uh, and some of the graphs we showed, or the, the bar charts we showed, are a combination of multiple studies. So it's where we're, we're more confident that this is something that reoccurs across studies. And it might be that in one of those studies it was a pretty flat line, but we include it, um, because it and, and it evens out. So, for example, there was one particular ex- field experiment which showed a huge effect for loss. And if we just cherry-picked that and thrown it up, that would have been a really nice finding. But we included it with all the ones that were a little bit more marginal. Um, I think part of, part of this is that, and I think this is true of lots of programs, we were working with Help to Save during a period of quite a lot of fluctuation. So it was, it was being developed and being rolled out. Uh, and so the population was constantly changing. The, the uh, information in the press was constantly changing. And so we're not operating in a constant world. Um, and so trying to get at this point of does it, does it repeat over time, I, I think is, is, is really important. Yeah. Tim. Can I chip in? Yeah. Um, I just want to give another example as well um, from sort of a health and social care. I think a lot of people have seen the antimicrobial resistance trial with the, the letters to the, um, from, from the chief medical officer to GPs about their prescribing practice. But, so we ran that as a randomised control trial. And then because it's sent to the top 20%, um, and subsequently we've sent it to all of the top 20%. We can't really run another trial in the same way. We've run different trials. But what we did a couple of years later was um, actually run a regress, regression discontinuity design analysis of the people sort of above and below who got the letter and didn't get the letter. And we actually see that we get a very similar effect. 
It's another nice way to sort of uh, use different methods uh, over time to kind of see whether there's something is still working or um, has worked. One last point. I think one of the benefits we had here was the, the lab to field idea. So in this point about replication, if we're seeing consistent results through a lab study and then into a field, I think we can be more sure that, it's, that we have something. Um, I don't think that's always the case, but I think it adds to, the, to, the, to our ability to convince someone that this is a, a real thing. Yeah, and, and I mean, going, going from lab to field is, is a time when you often get a change in, 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 in results. And I think it's important that actually that's well understood by people because otherwise that ends to sort of people not understanding that the result isn't firm until you've gone out into that real-world setting. So let me um, pick up on a couple of questions that have come in and, and try and combine them. Um, several people have said, great, this is, this is, this is really, really interesting. Um, did you find it difficult to do it in your department and were there difficult legal regulatory barriers that you had to overcome? In other words, what are, what are, what are the hurdles that you face and what other, that, that other people may face as well? Um, so, uh, as a regulator, we have unique powers to uh, uh, compel energy suppliers to participate in our trials. So that is actually that side of things was relatively easy compared to trialing in other departments. Um, so that wasn't too bad. Uh, but there were uh, other barriers along the way. Um, this won't be a surprise, but obviously, this supplies, even though we can compel them to participate in trials, they're not always keen on the idea. Um, so that was often uh, a barrier. Uh, there was an awful a lot of issues in terms of uh, the data sharing arrangements. That was one of our biggest uh, barriers in terms of actually implementing these trials. Getting the agreement, agreements in place to share data between the different parties is really tricky. And yes, obviously there were uh, legal um, things as well, making sure all the, uh, all the things were in place before and during the trials to make sure we were completely covered, that was a barrier. Uh, but, however, I think it's, um, nothing was not overcomable, and we are going to be publishing a lessons learned uh, document later in the year, which is going to cover lots of the stuff for other regulators who do want to do similar trials. Anyone else want to tackle this? Barriers, hurdles, things that people need to overcome? Well, I won't put this as a specific hurdle we face necessarily, but just to emphasise that point again, that I think you need to, as a behavioural science team, you have to be invited in. Uh, and so that puts a real premium on the relationship building, and it's a, a simple basic point, but it's also one that is surprisingly easy to neglect. So you have to have that clear sense uh, of who you're looking to work with and why it would be attractive for them, but also um, that you're working to the same hymn sheet rather than just trying to assert yourself uh, over various other policies or programmes. Okay, we've got time for just a, 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 a couple of very quick questions. One of them, I think, is, is very interesting, which is around, around um, what were the downsides? What are, the, what, what are the, the, the negative consequences that you might see? How do you think about that in your studies? And I want to frame that in a slightly different way, which is if you drew an analogy with sort of uh, clinical trials or something, you'd call it side effects. So my question is, you know, how do you think about unintended consequences and side effects in, in what you're doing? Oh, to, to a crack at it. I think, um, uh, yeah, what, one of the things we thought about uh, in our help to save work is, uh, so the aim here is to increase savings, um, and we're encouraging people to, to gain a, you know, about a £1,000 uh, of rainy day savings, because we know that's strongly linked with preventing people from going into poverty. Um, we are not sure that if we prompt people to save a small amount through help to save, that that doesn't sort of license them to, to not do anything else. Right, so this is the one. Because I've put fifty pounds away this this month, that's me done. My savings job is finished. It's over. I'll, uh, I'm now going to go down and do a shopping spree and, and 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 sort of waste all the good work. I think that's something that we were aware of, but something we have absolutely no data on. We have no ability to answer that question. So that's a concern for me. I think the other one I'll flag is slightly higher level and maybe links to that last talk is that, um, again, because we've only been able to show randomized control trials on communications, I think one of the side effects here is that we would sort of um, continue this point that behavioral science is just communications work. And I think we've actually done a lot more for Help to Save, but, but now when we give the presentation on Help to Save, we just talk about the communications. I think that's potentially a negative side effect uh, for the field.
Okay, thank you. We're out of time. There are lots more questions that people have, and uh, I'm sure you, they can catch you afterwards. And there are some ones that, that, that sounded to me like this sort of personal interest, like does the off-gem thing also apply to the telecom situation and what can you do about pension pots as well and so on. So there are lots of things in here to pick up on. I want to thank you because I think they were really good presentations and you kept the time. We had some questions and you can see there's a lot of interest being generated. And I'd like to also say that this um, success of moving from a central uh, uh, BIT to one that's now embedded in departments is incredibly important and one that needs to be promoted. So thank you very much. Thank you.